If you have your Bibles, hope that you do, turn with me to John chapter 19. And in just a moment, we're going to look at the section of Scripture there in John chapter 19. In their book, uh, Freakonomics, the authors LaVey and Dubner talk about, in the 1850s, the mortality rate uh, in the midst of delivery was one in six. Think about that. One out of every six deliveries ended in the death of the mother who was delivering. It's so foreign from my experience. I remember uh, many years ago sitting down with my grandmother and just kind of talking about family history, and her mother had died during the midst of childbirth, and, and, and she began to kind of go through her family history, and she pointed out person after person after person who had died in the midst of childbirth. And, and, and since my grandmother's time, uh, the mortality rate has gotten 50 times better, but it was nothing like Europe in the mid-1800s, one in six. And scientists were trying to figure out why that was the case, and so they began to study what was taking place, what was possibly causing the, their deaths. And, and early on in the midst of the research, they found something extremely interesting, and that was you were more likely to die in the hospital than out if you gave delivery. You were more likely to die if a doctor delivered the child than if a family member or a loved one, uneducated, delivered the child. And so they begin to come up with hypotheses of why this was taking place and what is it that was killing these women in the midst of what is this very natural process. And so a couple of ideas were thrown out. Some believed it was because of the tight corsets that were being worn early in pregnancy that somehow that, that changed the delivery process months later. My favorite hypothesis that they came up with was the, the idea that the women in the midst of their modesty and that modest culture, that in the midst of the, the delivery process, when the man entered the room, the doctor entered the room, they were so overwhelmed by embarrassment that that caused them to die. Now, how is it that educated people come up with that kind of hypothesis? One in six, and your explanation is tight clothing or modesty gone wrong. You know how that happens? Men come up with the solutions. Notice it. In that relationship, whose fault is it? It's the women. They're killing themselves, basically, in this process. All the scientists were men. And so their assumption, they were naturally biased to the concept that somehow these women are doing something wrong until one scientist found out what the actual problem was. In the mid-1800s, you know, scientific uh, research was beginning to take off, and the autopsy had come into a common practice. And so these doctors, wanting to, to learn as much as they possibly could and very well intended, they would treat their patients. But any second they had, they would skip lunch, they would skip breaks. Any second they had in between patients, they would go downstairs into the morgue and do autopsies. And they would learn, and they would research, they would figure all this up. And, and, and so finally, someone would come into labor and delivery. They would take the message to the doctor, and the doctor would go upstairs and deliver the child having never washed their hands. They were literally carrying death on their own hands. And these children were coming to life into this world in the hands of death. Imagine making that discovery. How sickening it must have felt in the moment, but the, the, the joy and the thrill to know that all the lives that you were going to save with, with this very simple invention, this very simple concept of washing your hands. Think about the fame that you could, you could get, the, the book tour that you could go on, all the speeches you could give because of how, how popular you would be because you made this discovery, you saved these lives. Think about how rich you could get in a capitalist kind of society. You could come up with a magic solution here that's nothing more than water and a little bit of chlorine, and you could say, this is going to solve it. Imagine what happened to that guy. You know what happened to that guy? He was ostracized, pushed aside, debunked, labeled as, as an outsider, as a heretic, as a failure. Why? Because how dare he? How dare he accuse us well-intended doctors who are giving our lives to save these patients? How dare he think that we are the ones who are causing the deaths? And with the truth right in front of them, they pushed it aside all because they wanted to save their own reputation, all because they couldn't confront the idea that it's possible, despite our well intentions, it's possible that our actions are actually causing this. Humanity has a horrible history of failing to recognize the role we play in the evil in this world. We have a horrible history of it. 
looking at our own hearts, looking at our own actions, looking at our own intentions, we will quickly justify ourselves, quickly blame anybody else, quickly ostracize anybody trying to tell us the truth, to confront us, to change us, to redirect us to the place that we're supposed to go. Humanity will save face and die over humbling ourselves and changing. And so even to this day, the idea of washing your hands is still underplayed and undervalued by so many, and yet we know, cognitively we know, that we can literally carry death on our hands. You doubt that? Everybody in this place, lick your hand right now. I wash my hands after shaking yours because I don't trust you. And I actually didn't lick. That's a whole different story. I'm a germaphobe whenever it comes to that. We don't recognize it. You know, as we look at the crucifixion of Jesus over these next couple of weeks, there's a great debate. Who, who is it that's responsible for the death of Jesus? Is it the Jews who were yelling crucify him? Is it the Romans who actually gave the, the, the edict and the verdict to crucify him? But we as Christians know that the one who is truly to blame is me. It's us. That ultimately it was our sin that drove him to the cross. Ultimately it's our responsibility that, that yes, the Jews play a role, and yes, the Romans play a role, and yes, you play a role, we all play a role, but in the end, when I'm confronted with the death of Jesus, I am looking at an innocent man who is dying on my behalf. He is paying a price for me. And one of the great gifts of the gospel, it's a difficult gift, but it is a gift of the gospel, is it allows us, it empowers us to recognize the role that we play, to admit it, to accept responsibility for what is taking place and in the midst of the responsibility to experience forgiveness. Until you are willing to own it. Until you are willing to own the responsibility for your own actions, to own the responsibility for your own rebellious heart, to own the consequences of your own sin. Until you are willing to admit, I am a man who is in need because of my rebellious, traitorous heart. The gospel has very little for you. But the moment you begin to recognize your need, your life begins to change. We're going to just look at a small section of Scripture here in John chapter 19. We're going to actually be here the next two weeks. The first two weeks, we're going to, uh, the, this first week, we're going to look at these first two words that Jesus spoke, and next week we're going to look at the last three. But let's read the section of Scripture, starting in verse number 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, in order to fulfill Scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, the last time I was with you a few weeks ago, whenever I was here, we weren't at the river, but the last time I was here with you, we, we left Jesus with Pilate. He had been arrested, the trial had begun, and he and Pilate were having a conversation. And we looked at the question where Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? Pilate was trying to excuse truth, to say truth doesn't actually exist, to, to give a very pragmatic approach to what he was about to do, to, to justify himself and the actions that was about to take place. Well, since that time, through the rest of chapter uh, 19, we see an interaction between Pilate, Jesus, and and the people. And Pilate, this symbolism of the great Roman government, the symbolism of a power of might, of being able to do whatever it is that he wanted to do, was terrified. He was terrified. He, he was the Roman leader of that region, but he wasn't the ultimate Roman emperor. So he had a boss that was above him. So his primary job was to keep enough peace in the region to where the people would live peaceful lives and not bring an uprising. Because if an uprising occurred, the Romans would hear about it back in Rome, and they would send their army in and swoop in, and they would squash the uprising. But in so doing, the leader of the Roman government would look at Pilate and say, you're not doing your job, and he'd be out as well. And so Pilate wanted to keep peace as best as he possibly can in the midst of carrying out whatever it is the Romans wanted uh, to carry out. And, and so Pilate in this moment is drawn toward Jesus, it feels like, it seems like. It seems like there's just something about Jesus. There's something intriguing to him. He, he's a seeker in many ways. He, he, he's enjoying these conversations that he's having with Jesus. He, he knows that Jesus isn't responding, isn't interacting like a normal prisoner would. He, he, he's probably had thousands of these interactions, yet there's something about Jesus that draws Pilate in, and Pilate looks at Jesus and he says, I don't find any fault in this man. And, and he goes back to the Jews and he says, this man is innocent. He hasn't done anything. But the Jews say, but we have a law in which he is claimed to be the Son of God. He, he's claiming to be the Messiah. He's, he's committing heresy, and he deserves to die. Uh, well, Pilate wasn't a religious man. He didn't care. 
And so the Jews said, but whenever he claims to be the son of God, that means he also claims to be the king. He's claiming to be Caesar. Now that's treason. You should kill him for his treason. And Pilate looks at Jesus and sees nothing wrong. So he's trying to figure out a way. How can he keep the crowd at bay without having to to crucify this innocent man? And so he comes up with a plan because he knows it's a Passover holiday. He knows that there's a tradition of, of letting one prisoner go. And so he goes in the prison and he finds kind of the most notorious prisoner of them all, Barabbas. And he he thinks to himself, well, there is no way this crowd is going to release release Barabbas over Jesus. And so he brings Barabbas out. He says, all right, who do you want to release? We get to release one. Do you want to basically release Jesus who hasn't done anything to any of you all? Or Barabbas, who is this known robber who's probably stolen from half of you. And the crowd begins to chant, release Barabbas. And, And the plan of Pilate is thwarted. And so he takes Jesus back in, and so he comes up with another plan that he's going to have Jesus flogged. It's a beating that would take him to the very edge of death. It would make him look horrible, look like he was on the very verge of death. And so Jesus was flogged, and a crown of thorns was created just for him and pressed down upon his head. A fake robe was given to him to to make him look like a king. They were mocking him now uh, at at this moment. You see the soldiers, as they come up and they beat him, calling him the king of the Jews as a mockery that was there. And and just when they got Jesus to the edge of death, they brought Jesus out out in front of the crowd again, thinking now, Pilate thinks to himself that the, the crowd can shout, crucify him all day long. But, but when you see a beaten man, even if you think he's guilty, when you see a beaten man, you can't help but have empathy in that moment. And yet the crowd has no empathy. They keep on shouting, crucify him. And so Pilate takes Jesus back in the back again. They have another private conversation in which, Jesus, in, in which Pilate looks at, at Jesus and says, who are you? There's just something about him. In the midst of the beating, there, there wasn't a, a, an outcry from Jesus. There wasn't a hatred toward the, toward the soldiers. There, there wasn't any maybe outward emotion that is now attacking, showing the anger, showing the bitterness that is there. Pilate has seen that a thousand times. And yet Jesus has this way to have this self-control. In the midst of the anguish, in the midst of the grief, in the midst of the pain, Jesus has this self-control uh, that draws Pilate in. And Pilate says, who are you? Well, Jesus had already told him. And Jesus doesn't answer. And that irritates Pilate. You answer Pilate. You don't ignore Pilate. And Pilate looks at Jesus and basically says, well, who do you think you are? Do you not understand that at this very moment that that life and death are in my hands, that I have the authority to crucify you, and now you're not going to speak to me? How dare you? And Jesus looks at him and says, any authority you have is given to you from up on high. You don't say that to Pilate. What Jesus said in that moment is, is, look, son, look at who you are. Yeah, you have authority, but that authority has been given to you. It's been granted to you. It's not something that you just possess because you're smarter than everybody else. You don't own it. You're not God that's here. And the pilot that has been drawn toward Jesus is suddenly done with him. Now, we could take a week. We're not going to, but we could take a week and look at the life of Pilate of of how in many ways he symbolizes kind of a modern seeker of Jesus. Some people would look at Pilate and think he was a Christian. Because he's drawn by Jesus, he's, he's attracted to him, he's intrigued by him. And, and yet Jesus has, has already warned us in other teachings that it's very difficult for a rich man, very difficult for a powerful man to receive the gospel. Why is that? Because think about what it would demand from Pilate here. It would demand a humility from Pilate in which he would be willing to say that you as a common man are greater than me. That my position means nothing, that I'm just a common man too. And I now need you. Well, powerful men tend not to say that. Rich men tend not to say that. Pilate couldn't say that. And there finally came a breaking point for Pilate in which he was willing to walk away. And that breaking point was the moment that Jesus said, you need to recognize who you are. And you're not nearly as great as you think you are. And Pilate was done. And he went out and he sat down on the judgment seat and he condemned Jesus to death. And they led him to the cross. Whenever they got there, they put above Jesus a a sign that Pilate had said. Pilate had said right above this man, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Well, well, some of the Jewish leaders, they were very happy because they were getting what they want, so they didn't want to throw much of a stink because Pilate might change his mind, but but they didn't like that idea. They didn't like uh, the title above Jesus to say, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And and they said, sir, excuse me, sir, if you don't mind, don't you think we need to put on there, uh, Jesus of Nazareth claims to be the King of the Jews? And Pilate, in this interesting little twist of history, says, I've written what I've written. 
And so as Jesus dies on the cross, his true title stands above him. He truly was the king of the Jews. And so sure enough, even as he is dying, some of the soldiers call out, behold the king of the Jews. They mean it as a slap. They mean it as mockery. But in that moment, they are actually speaking truth. And as Jesus is suffering, we see the words that Ed covered last week, that he looks down and he sees his mother. And he turns and he sees John and he says, behold your mother, behold your son. And he creates in part a, a foretaste of what the church is going to be. He creates this new community that is now defined, not, uh, this new family that is not now defined by our genetic blood, but instead by this blood of adoption through Jesus Christ. That their needs are going to be taken care of even in the midst of their loss because of this common connection, this union they have in what will be the church. And then we come to today's text. And the text says in verse number 28 that after it was all finished, meaning after Jesus had completed everything he needed to complete, after everything was set into motion to take care of the crucifixion as it needed to be taken care of, after everything else was finished, Jesus then said, I thirst. It's an interesting confession. We don't normally get physical confessions from Jesus of a physical need. You know, we saw it a little bit with the woman at the well where Jesus had been walking and traveling and teaching so much that the disciples left him at the well so he could get a drink and they went on into town so they could get him some food and they came back and he was talking uh, to this woman that was there. But, but even in the midst of that, Jesus didn't necessarily say, hey boys, I'm hungry. But now after everything was done, he, he now confesses, I thirst. Why? And, and why does John include it? you got to remember that, remember, John is picking uh, what, he, what he's going to tell. He has all these facts that are laid out. And, and like a prosecuting attorney now making the case to us, the jury, that, that he wants to convince us that Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God. John is now picking what parts of the story he wants to tell to, to convince us. He's not making stuff up, but, but he's already told us he has to leave a lot out. He says that, that if all the books in the world were to try to write down what Jesus has done, there wouldn't be enough, uh, to, enough books to write all of it down. So he has to pick and choose what he's going to tell. And he picks this idea of I thirst in a way that the other gospel writers did not. Why? Well, in part, I think what John goes to great lengths to do is to show that Jesus is still in control. Even in the midst of the cross, even as he has submitted himself to this Roman system that is full of evil, even as all these things are happening that should not be happening, Jesus is still fully in control. He's still fully in charge. And so even at the very end, he can say, I thirst, in order to fulfill Scripture, probably Psalm 66, maybe also Psalm 22, where they're going to give him sour wine. He says, I thirst. We don't even know if it's a prayer to the Father or just a comment to the soldiers. He says, I thirst, and then they offer him this sour wine, this fulfillment of Scripture. That's an interesting concept, because before the cross, they'd offered him real wine, well, wine that would give him a little bit inebriated, and Jesus refused it. He refused to take anything that was going to lessen his pain on the cross. He endured it all. He, he refused any, any sense of, of epidural before the cross. He refused it all. He wanted to feel it all. And yet now that it was all done, they offered him the sour wine, this cheap wine. This cheap wine that would in, in no way lessen him, his pain. As a matter of fact, it, it had the potential of making it worse. I've been in hospice situations where the doctors come in and said there's nothing else we can do the patient is no longer requesting fluids, requesting food, only give them what they request. If they don't, just don't, don't give them anything. And they expect the patient to die within a few hours or the next day, and they don't. And, and then another day passes, and they still have it. Another day passes, and, and then they start to ask questions. What's going on? The doctor comes in, is trying to review everything, and they finally figure out that somebody in the family is still sneaking them water. Well intended. The, the idea of... of of their family member having thirst in that moment. It's too much for them to bear, and so they, they just can't stand that thought, and so they're, they're sneaking them against the wishes of the rest of the family and the medical advice of the doctors. They're sneaking them water. I've, I've heard hospice doctors begin to explain that it's well intended, but it actually can do more harm than good. That can actually keep their body kind of more alert, more awake. It can actually give them a greater sense of pain. That while the body was shutting down in the midst of dehydration, they probably weren't even recognizing their thirst. Well, Jesus here in this moment, as his body is overwhelmed with dehydration, now requests the sour wine. It's not going to take away the pain. It actually might make it worse. But he does so not only to fulfill Scripture, but he probably does so in part 
Because dehydration is setting in and Jesus still has one more thing to say. And it seems like he doesn't want to say this final thing on the cross with a whisper. The life of Jesus does not end with a whimper. It ends with a shout. As a matter of fact, Matthew and Mark and Luke tells us a loud groan is how he ended. But John actually knows what he said in the moment. Maybe he was close enough to actually hear. John actually knows what he says. Jesus is going to end his life with a loud phrase, it is finished. And it's a cry of victory in that moment, not a whimper of defeat, but a cry of victory for in that moment, the internal plan of God himself to rescue humanity, to provide for us a way to be back to God has been completed in the midst of the suffering and the sorrow of Jesus Christ himself. And he is going to let the world know what we're going to look at next week, that it is finished. But he can't shout it the way he wants to shout it because he's in the midst of dehydration. And so it's very possible that the reason Jesus at this moment finally let people know of a physical need that he had was just because he needed to wet his whistle a little bit. Because he was about to shout, but he couldn't with the dehydration that's being taken place. And so he said, I thirst. And they give him that wine, and it fulfills Scripture in that moment. And John includes it, I think, in part to show the control that Jesus had. What a great promise that is to us today. In the midst of, of a system that we haven't always created or a system that we don't necessarily buy into or a system that we aren't in control of. In the midst of sorrows and consequences and griefs and pain, some of which are our consequences of our own decisions, some of which are the horrible decisions of other people. Many things are just the reality of fallen people in a fallen world. We experience so many trials and temptations and griefs and sorrows in our lives. It can feel as though nobody is in control, and yet this passage reminds us every single day that Jesus is in control. It means whatever is taking place in your life, whatever sorrow or grief or uncertainty that is there, if you don't know what the test is going to read this week, if you're upset at what the test read last week, if you don't know if your job is going to still be there a year from now, or you don't know where the economy is going to go, you don't know where your life is at this moment, you don't like the aging process and what is before you, it means whatever is taking place in your life, even if it's outside of your control, even if it's just a system that you have to submit yourself to, that you have no say in whatsoever, we have the great promise that we live under the great umbrella of God's sovereignty that nothing can thwart his plan, and that everything that takes place in your life, he can use for your good and for his glory. It may not feel like it in the moment. I'm not saying you have to like it. You have to enjoy it. You have to be happy about it. What I am saying is you can rest underneath the umbrella of that with an empowerment and encouragement to know that God is not going to waste this pain. That means we stand on the very foundation of God's providence. It means that his secret hand is at work in ways that we can't even begin to understand. That God can use the evil decision of other people, the evil systems of this world, the bad choices of ourselves, the bad choices of other people, and God can use that and very quietly, in an unseen way, he can knit together everything in our lives to get us to the very place that he wants us to be. We can't see that hand in the moment. You don't know where God is, what he's doing at this very moment, but you can look back. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you can look back and you can say he's always been faithful. He's always been there. I can see how his hand has always been at work, and seeing God's hand at work in the past can give you trust that God's hand is work right now, and a future is going to come in which you're going to be able to look back on this thing and go, oh, that's with God. He was doing it right now. He's always in control. It's a great hope for us today that I live, literally live under the umbrella of God's sovereignty and on the foundation of God's providence. He's at work. But is it possible? Is it possible that there's more at play than even that? That, that on face value, that's exactly what is going on in John's book, that Jesus is in control even up to the last moments. But John, man, John, he's more mystical than I am. We told you this at the very beginning. I mean, just a few chapters ago. So, you know, two years ago, whatever. We, we told you this from the very beginning, that John's more mystical. He, he loves the double meaning. And, and Jesus seemed to love the double meaning. And, and so in John chapter 2, Jesus is at the temple where he kind of throws his holy fit. And he says, tear down this temple and in three days I'll rebuild it. And, and the people are taking him at, the, at this very literal message. Well, Jesus means it very metaphorically. He's talking about himself. Well, in John chapter 3, he's talking about Nicodemus. And to Nicodemus, Jesus says, if you want a relationship with God, you must be born again. Well, Nicodemus takes that a very literal kind of concept. How can a man be born again? Jesus means in a very metaphorical kind of way. In John chapter 4, Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, and they're talking about thirst. 
And Jesus says, I have a water that if you drink it, you will never thirst again. And the woman is looking down at this well and thinking to herself, how can one drink of water ever make you not thirsty again? She's thinking about it in a very literal way when it's somewhat metaphorical. Is it possible? Is it possible that even as Jesus is literally thirsting, that the reason John tells this story and the other gospel writers don't is because he also wants us to catch a very metaphorical meaning that's here. Jesus is at the very end of the cross. And at this moment, the weight of sin has been placed upon his shoulders. And what he is going through physically, the dehydration, he is probably also beginning to experience spiritually. He's never had the weight of sin on him before. And sin begins to dry out our souls. It begins to numb our hearts. And is it possible that whenever Jesus said, I thirst, that in part that was truly him standing in our place, confessing to the Father our spiritual condition? We are spiritually dehydrated. It's what sin does to us. It, our own personal sin will dry out our hearts. Living in the sin-stained, broken world will dehydrate us. And what does that look like? When dehydration begins to take over your body, many things are happening, but we can narrow them down to just a few. One, uh, lethargy sets in. You're, you become lethargic. Your body is now trying to conserve the, the few resources that it has, and so you can no longer do everything that you used to do, and so your body begins to very naturally begin to shut down to conserve the energies. You begin to get a tunnel vision. You've heard about this from cyclists, from runners as well, that, that all of a sudden they will lose all sense of the periphery of their vision. Their perspective will tunnel in to just that which is right before them. And you lose all sense of judgment. Your ability. Your ability to take a situation and to put it into a broader context. You, you can't do that anymore. You can't reason anymore. You can't understand anymore. Whenever physical dehydration begins to take place, you become lethargic. You lose your vision, your perspective, you become, and then you lose your ability to reason. That, to me, explains many of us today. Followers of Jesus, who, who have become spiritually dehydrated, maybe because of our own sin, maybe because of our own lack of discipline, we've We've stopped having the discipline of, of making sure that we're drinking in from the river of God on a regular basis, from surrounding ourselves and putting ourselves in a climate that will replenish us and rejuvenate us, maybe because of our own rebellion. Maybe it's just the weariness of being at work in this sin-stained world. But I think in so many ways, what Jesus is going through here physically models us spiritually. We thirst and so we become lethargic. Our body now is beginning to shut down and to conserve the energies that we have. We no longer have a, a spiritual energy. There is no longer a spiritual passion about the things that truly matter, about the things that are truly important. We're no longer willing to stand up against injustice. We're no longer willing to stand up on the side of those that have no voice. We're no longer willing to fight for our marriages, to fight for our children, to engage our minds and our hearts and our souls for the well-being of the spiritual nourishment of our children, the important things of life. We become lethargic about, apathetic about. And so we think to ourselves, we only have so much time. We only have so much energy. And so we have to shut down. We have to choose some things that we're not going to do. And so we think to ourselves, well, I'll just stop volunteering. You know, that I'll, I'll just kind of take care of these spiritual things on myself. I'm going I'm to stop going to a small group. I really don't have time to disciple or be discipled. You know, I don't, I mean, I'll worship when I'm around. And we begin in our lethargy to remove ourselves from the very things that are going to replenish our souls. And we, we keep on expending energy in places that don't matter. And so we teach our sons nothing about spiritual things, but we can teach them how to hit a tee shot. Our kids have no perspective of what wisdom is all about, but we can make sure they have everything they need to look good. 
and we're spiritually apathetic. Trying to stay busy in these other places so we won't have to face the reality of our own hearts. We begin to lose vision. Perspective is lost. It all tunnels in to ourselves and what is right before us. We have no sense or comprehension of eternity. No sense or comprehension of the pain of those who are around us or how we could come in and step in and ease that pain or be a part of that pain. No, no real concern over the salvation of, of those who are beyond us other than hoping, ho- hoping just beyond hope that those closest to us might get it somehow. But, but we have no real passion or vision for what, what role we could play in the midst of all this. We just become so tunnel vision and we begin to lose our perspective, our judgment. Our ability to understand, to put things in the broader picture of everything that God has said. And so before long, we begin to call that which is evil, good. And we call that which is good, evil. And without even recognizing it, we actually begin to expend what little energy we have against the kingdom of God rather than for it. And in so many ways, that describes the church in America, the church in Fort Smith, in so many ways that describes us. Let me ask you a question today. How's your heart? How is it? Is it flourishing? Is it strong? Is it pumping the way it should? Is it properly hydrated to accomplish everything it needs to accomplish? Or is it dried out? Well, there's a simple test here to figure it out. How's your spiritual energy? On things that matter. When you step into worship today, is there an excitement? Is there a hope? Is there a a need that, God, you're going to meet me in this place, the power of the Holy Spirit? Or is it a checklist? How's your involvement in the lives of other people? Are you having spiritual conversations? Is there somebody in your life who can step into your life and tell you no? Is there somebody that you count on, that you call on? Is there somebody that you're looking at and you're watching them grow spiritually and it's exciting to you, it's replenishing to you, and you want to take them even further? How is your action at this moment? Or is it possible that there's some lethargy that is set in? You're just lethargic. Worship doesn't mean much. Small group doesn't mean much. Service doesn't mean much. And the places that you're truly passionate, if we were to be honest, won't matter a week from now, much less right now. How's your vision? Do you still see on the periphery of society? Do you still see the people who can do nothing for you, who can help you in no way? Do you still see them as human beings, as ways that you can help them and aid them and assist them? Do you still see them as as people who are valued by God himself? Or have you gotten so tunneled vision that all you can see is what is right before you this week and all you can see is what is on your plate? How's your judgment? Do you have the ability? Do you have the ability to call wrong what is wrong? To call right what is right? Without a sense of judgment, without a sense of superiority, but, but standing now on the truth of God to say, no, God says this is out of bounds. You have the ability to call it out in your own tribe, with your own people, with us. You see, the heart that is fully alive to the things of God, the heart that has experienced the heart transplant from Jesus himself, who is now tapped into the nourishment of the Holy Spirit, is now at work. We are active in this world. We understand that we have limited resources and limited time. And, and so we, 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 we ignore the other things that don't matter, and we invest ourselves and we fight the battles that truly do matter because we have this perspective. We don't just look at today, we see eternity. We don't just look at ourselves, we see everybody else and God's plan at work within this world because we have the sense of judgment where we can actually call out what is wrong and what is right and we are actively involved within this world. A heart that is nourished by the Holy Spirit is fully alive and is not dehydrated. But we are. And oh, how I can feel it. And there are times in which I think to myself, am I right about this or not? I'm trying to understand what God is saying here, but man, I'm having a tough time. Because my vision is so narrow that I can't have a good judgment. And my vision is narrow because I'm so lethargic 
that in part, I, I feel like, you know what, I've read this before. Do I really need to read it again? And good Lord, how many sermons do I need to preach? Can't we just show the video of last year? And do I really need to volunteer? I mean, I'm a professional here. I give a lot. Do I, do I really need to do this more? And unfortunately, it becomes a very sad cycle. And notice how they're all interconnected. You become lethargic, which means not only can you not see around them much, you don't make much effort to do so. And the lack of perspective, the focused in just on yourself, now clouds your judgment. So you don't have the energy to make a wise decision. You don't have the perspective now to make a wise decision. And your judgment is already cloudy, which means that whenever you feel this weariness, you begin to try to find ways to conserve energy. And the very thing you back out of is the very thing you need to renourish your soul, which narrows your perspective even more, which clouds your judgment even more. And we are a spiritually dehydrated people. Now, here's the scary thing. There are some in this room that feel it. There comes a place in dehydration that you feel it. I can feel it sometimes, hot summer day, I'm out playing golf, and suddenly I recognize, man, I better drink some water. I'm, 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 I'm on my way to dehydration, which means for me, I'm, I'm on my way to making kidney stones, which I do not want to do. I better down some water. I better go find some shade. I better find some way to re-nourish here if I don't. And if you suddenly you notice you stop sweating, you take these signs, you better do something about it. But do you realize that there comes a place whenever you're spiritually dehydrated, whenever you're physically dehydrated, that you can pass this threshing point in which you no longer realize it? And so you're experiencing these symptoms, but because your judgment is clouded, And because your body is beginning to shut down, you can be dehydrated and not even know it. Somebody could put a glass of water in front of you and you wouldn't even have a desire for the water. What's scary to me is this. There's a group of people in this room today. There are individuals in this room right now who literally your very soul is wasting away and you don't know it. You don't feel it. You don't sense it. You're apathetic about the things of God, but you don't see it because you're so passionate about these things that don't matter. You've lost all sense of peripheral vision, but you don't recognize it because you're so crystal clear on looking at yourself. You've lost all sense of judgment, and you don't even know it, and there's nothing we can do about it other than to beg God through the power of His Holy Spirit to open up your eyes. There is nothing I can do. But you know what is some good news here today? There's a good number of us that are on the edge of being there, and yet we can feel it. We can sense it. We can sense the thirst in part. You can look at the signs. It's because we're trying to drink from everything just to satisfy it, but it's not satisfying. It's like being out in the ocean, dying of thirst and seeing nothing but salt water around. We become deceived enough to begin to try to drink the salt water, thinking to ourselves, that's going to replenish us, not realizing that actually makes the situation worse. That's what's happening at work. That's what's happening with money. That's what's happening with materialism. That's what's happening with sports. We're trying to satisfy our souls with a salt water that will not do it. But your thirst is a gift. It's a gift from God himself that literally could go away one day and you'll never recognize it, you'll never realize it, you'll never care about it again until life slaps you in the face or you stand before a holy and just God and it's too late. But if you're thirsty today, if you can sense it, if you can sense a spiritual apathy, if you can sense a tunnel vision of selfishness, if you can sense a difficulty in understanding what is wise and unwise, if you can sense it today and you can say, oh, Kevin, I am thirsty. The good news for you today is there is nothing that God loves more than to replenish a dry soul. Nothing. And literally, like a spring rain that is coming whenever the land is in desperate need, the Holy Spirit can pour down on your life in powerful ways. And worship can have a vibrancy and volunteering can have a vibrancy and discipleship can have a vibrancy and the Word of God can have a vibrancy to where you begin to see everything that you've been missing. And a spiritual energy begins to pick up as your vision begins to widen, as your judgment becomes more clear and your heart and your soul will come alive. That is what God can do for you today. 
if you're tired, if you're worn out, if you're weary. All you have to do today is pray the very thing that God himself has modeled for us through Jesus. Say, I thirst. I thirst. Now, just saying those words won't be enough. But if you pray those words in a meaningful prayer to the Father today, and you are then willing to back that up with action, to let us know about it, to let us assist you, to find ways to replenish your soul, to let us pray for you and pray with you and teach you how to read Scripture and figure out Scripture, to confront the sorrows and the sins within your own lives, to see what ways you're dehydrating your own soul and you don't even realize why you're doing it. If you will then do the work to back up that prayer, your heart can become fully alive, I have no doubt.